kind of good to do that song every week here for a while. It's a good reminder, isn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Psalm 96 says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. This morning we want to make much of God as our provider. Jehovah Jireh, his Hebrew compound name for God, one of the names of God. And we want to encounter him as provider, to experience him as provider. In every way, even when we don't understand, God provides. And when we make much of him in any particular area, we fulfill a core purpose for our lives and we enter into this kind of transformational process. It changes us. The deeper, more intentional, Reflecting, contemplating, worship, reading the scripture with a view to ask, what is God like and what is he calling us to? It's paired with action that results in the abundant life. 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. As we behold him, look at him, gaze upon him, exalt him, think about him as provider, we begin to be changed. John chapter 6. I thought rather than just dialing into the story about the Lord as our provider in Genesis 22, I wanted to look at Jesus and how he reframed this whole thing of God's provision and who he is as provider. And then we'll look back at Genesis 22 and refer back to that. But this morning in particular, I want to underline how God himself is our provider and that all that we need we can see in the person of Jesus. The Lord, the scripture said, says, is your portion. Let's pray. Lord, as we read more of your word this morning, would you speak to us? In your name we pray, amen. So as we read this text this morning, a story many of you are familiar with, and then the follow-up comments by Jesus, I want to invite you just to think about, even in your own life, to not only think about the areas where you need provision or the areas in the past where you've needed provision and God's answered prayer, think about other people that you know who are in desperate need of provision, But I want you even beyond thinking about the need that you have in your life 
to just lift your head a little bit up and turn your gaze, the gaze of your heart, to Jesus. John 6, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him. For he knew what he would do. He said this to test him, for he knew what he would do. How many of you are in that place in your life where it's almost like the question's being asked. Where's the provision that I need? Where's the provision that we need? Isn't it strange when Jesus is the one even asking that question? When he's asking you that question. Where is the provision you need? He asked Philip this. He says he was testing him. As we talked about it last week when they came to the waters of Marah, where the waters were bitter. The Lord brought them to this place to test them, to see if they would trust him, that he's trustworthy and that he would provide. And now he's testing Philip. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Jesus, I... You know, didn't make it all the way through school, but I took basic math. I know how to calculate things. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number, and then it's plus women and children on top of that. Some estimate maybe 12,000 people. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And there's a little inserted story about Jesus walking on the water. (laughs) And then we pick up the next day, verse 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? How'd you get here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs. Remember signs, the definition of that word is One definition could be a glimpse of God's nature, his glory, his character. You're seeking me not because you saw a glimpse of the glory of God that was revealed through that miracle, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. In other words, you're hanging out with me because you know this thing happens that if you a little bit of bread, boom. Boom. 
And then he says, verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Jesus now speaking of himself. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Now this is more than when Jesus says, you must believe in me. You have to believe in the son in order to have eternal life. It's beyond uh, just intellectual assent, checking a box. Okay, I believe in you. Way to go. You're amazing. I like the old amplified version that uh, in the old amplified translation of the scripture, there was always after the word believe, there was always a dash and it said, adhere to, trust in, and rely upon. And I always love that because it just was always a reminder to me whenever Jesus would call us to believe, it meant to adhere to him, to trust in him, and to rely upon him. Verse 30, so they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? <laughs> Doesn't that sound kind of funny? They were just with him a couple days ago and he multiplied the bread. But there's a reason why they're asking this. It might not be what you think. Verse 31, they say, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Okay, so let's pause here just for a moment. So the rabbis taught that when Messiah came, that he would bring the bread of heaven. These people are looking at the miracle Jesus just did and looking back and going, um, that was bread that somebody had that was multiplied. That didn't like come down from heaven. So they didn't believe that that didn't specifically fulfill the promise that the Messiah was to fulfill. Not only that, the rabbis also taught that after the first temple, when the Ark of the Covenant was in there, there was a jar that contained the manna, the bread that came from heaven. And, and some of them taught that Jeremiah the prophet went in and he stole away the jar of manna and Jeremiah hid it and he was hiding it until the days came when Messiah would come and Jeremiah would give this bread from the Ark of the Covenant to the Messiah to give to the people and it would be multiplied. So see, they're all, they all have this mindset. Everybody in Israel would know this and would know the stories and are waiting from, for Messiah to bring bread from heaven. Now notice what Jesus does, as he usually does, when it comes to not only any question that we have in life, but when it comes to this big question of provision. Verse 32, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. In other words, you've been thinking a lot about Moses, how Moses prayed, and then every day there was manna, six out of seven days of the week, there's this bread that appeared on the ground. That wasn't Moses that gave it to you, God gave that to you. Actually, for some of you, this is worth the whole morning that you would be reminded, Jesus would come to you and underline, it is not your boss that provides for you, it is not your company that provides for you, it is not how much sales you do on the internet that your provision is coming from as a follower of Jesus. He is your provider. And then listen to this. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to him, said to them, I am the bread of life. Yeah. 
I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, speaking of people. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Is that so beautiful or what? In the middle of talking about provision and bread and manna and being the Messiah, all of the challenges, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus says that he's the bread of life. He is Jehovah Jireh. Back in Genesis 22, remember Abraham, he'd been promised by God he would be the father of many nations, that he would, he's the father of faith. Your descendants were outnumber the stars in the heavens. And he went 25 years until he had a kid. Actually, he had one kid before that from another woman. It's a different story. You know, some of the Bible's R-rated. And And then he had Isaac, the child of promise, and God calls him, I want, you to, I want you to now take your firstborn, and I want you to offer him to me as a sacrifice. This long story in Genesis 22, very powerful, very hard to understand. Why would God do this? So he and Isaac are on their way on this journey. They end up going to Mount Moriah, which is where the temple was built, which is probably the Temple Mount in Jerusalem currently. Abraham goes, he takes Isaac, puts him on the altar, straps him on there, and he's about to kill him. And God says, no, stop. I was testing you. Now I know that you believe that you were willing to give even your own son. That, by the way, is not a model for faith in terms of what we're supposed to try to practice to show faith. Actually, when you read in the New Testament, it says Abraham believed God. He had so much faith, he believed that even if his son died, that God would raise him there from the dead. Wow. So God says, no, don't kill him. And right then he looks, and there's a ram whose head is caught in a thicket, and he says, that's the sacrifice. You offer that, that ram. The ram, by the way, was a, a picture of Jesus who would come. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Remember John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here he comes. So Abraham offers this ram in sacrifice. And he says this. He called the place Jehovah Jireh. This is the place that the Lord provided. I came to offer my very best. And God himself stepped in, in the place of sacrifice, and provided. What a powerful picture of provision. And the other way you can translate Jehovah Jireh is, in the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen. There's something about seeing in that word gyra that has to do with provision. So important to get this. The place of sacrifice is where multiplication happens. <laughs> Little boy gives the bread and the fish, sacrifices his lunch. Boom. Abraham gives his one and only son, offers him before God, and the Lord provides.
when we begin to encounter God as Jehovah Jireh, as our provider, when we make much of him as our provider, we begin to be transformed in that we are willing then to give God our first and our best. Many people, when it comes to giving to God, it's almost like they're at a restaurant and they're trying to figure out the tip, the least amount that they can give. It's like writing that in there. Thank you. And there's this scarcity and this fear of not having enough that comes. That's why Jesus talks so much about money, I think. He wants to free us from a fear of not having enough. He wants us to trust. Imbalance and how we approach provision produces more confusion, fear, and idolatry than I think probably any other area of life. Do you agree with that? Just do this if you kind of maybe a little bit agree with that. Yeah. Statistically, couples fight twice as much about money than they do about sex. Maybe the men aren't the ones instigating those conversations, but. All right, see, now I just gave you something to forgive me for, some of you in the room, right there. <laughs> there is a constant push in our culture to produce more, to make more, to have more. If that is the only filter we live by is productivity, then we're going to miss out on what God has for us. That's why he calls us to have a day of rest. A day of the week. I love Walter Brueggemann's book on Sabbath. It's called Sabbath as resistance. And what he's talking about is, is how you have a day of, of the week that you set aside where you're trusting God, where you're forced into a place where you're not producing anything. How many of you would agree that that's hard to do? Where you put stuff away, where you're not trying to make money, you're not trying to do deals, you're not trying to, on this day we're going to worship, on this day we're going to remind ourselves that God is in control. I don't personally think it has to be Sunday. I think it could be Saturday. I, don't, I mean, you, it could be any day of the week. If that's the day that you worship, if you gather with other followers of Jesus, and this is a day of rest, it was meant to serve you, not you serve it. But you miss out on the benefit of it if you don't have a day of rest where you're experiencing God as Jehovah Jireh. I'm telling you, this is where, that's why we do what we do. Even though for some people, we're just kind of going through the motions. It's like, oh, we sing, we worship, we praise God, and then, well, they're doing an offering thing, whatever. Yeah, the church needs money, and you miss out on the meaning of the whole thing. We're into God's word. We're seeking him. We're receiving daily bread. We're experiencing Jesus as the bread of life, and then we're responding to him. In fact, today, in just a few minutes, before we have communion today, I'm going to give opportunity for those of you who are here who would say, I've never really surrendered everything in my life to Jesus, and it's especially clear in this area of him being my provider. I live in my life ruled by fear of not having enough. It keeps me awake at night. It gives me head. You might not have all the symptoms. You know, this is like a, a, an ad for some sort of prescription. <laughs> Possible side effects of not trusting God as your provider. <laughs> Nausea, lightheadedness, <laughs> gastrointestinal problems, <laughs> anxiety, depression. Please contact your doctor if thoughts of suicide persist. It's true. Jesus called us to live a kind of life, Matthew 6, such a beautiful picture of it, not worrying about possessions, but seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, knowing all these things will be added to us. I want to read you this poem. I read this a few weeks ago, and it's just, it kind of gripped me so much so 
that I'm going to read it today, but I just keep thinking about it. And this is a poem written by Stanley Wiersma, uh, the late professor of, uh, at Calvin College. And he's using a farming example in this poem, but I want you to think about it in terms of your own life. You might go, well, I'm not a farmer, check, but just, just listen to this. Were my parents right or wrong not to mow the ripe oats that Sunday morning with the rainstorm threatening? I reminded them that the Sabbath was made for man and of the ox fallen into the pit. Without an oats crop, I argued, the cattle would need to survive on town-bought oats, and then it wouldn't pay to keep them. Isn't selling cattle at a loss like an ox in a pit? My parents did not argue we went to church. We sang the usual psalms louder than usual. We and the other whose harvests were at stake sang, Jerusalem, where blessing awaits, our feet are standing in thy gates. God, be merciful to me. On thy grace, I rest my plea. The pastor's spur of the moment concession, he rides on the clouds, the wings of the storm, the lightning and wind his missions perform. He made no concessions on sermon length. Five good reasons for infant baptism, though we heard little of it. For more floods came and more winds blew and beat upon that house than we had figured on. Even more lightning and thunder and hail the size of pullet eggs. Falling branches snapped the electric wires. We sang the closing psalm without the organ and in the dark. Ye seed from Abraham descended, God's covenant love is never ended. Afterward we rode by our oats field, flattened. We will still mow it, Dad said. Ten bushels to the acre, maybe, what would have been 50 if I had mowed right after milking, and if the whole family had shocked. We could have had it weatherproof before the storm. Later at dinner, Dad said, God was testing us. I'm glad we went. Those psalms never gave me such a lift as this morning. Mother said, I wouldn't have missed it. And even I thought but did not say how guilty we would feel now if we had saved the harvest. The one time dad asked me why I live in a black neighborhood, I reminded him of that Sunday morning. And he understood. Now you may have gotten lost a little there with some of the language. But I think you get the picture. Kids being trained. That we worship and we trust. That God is our provider. And when the math doesn't work. We back up and worship. And we look to him as the bread of life. Jesus, our provider. See, here's the key. Making much of God is our provider. The key is that we step back and we ascribe to him the honor that's due his name. We worship him and we put him first. And that we are a people not run by a need to make more than everybody else. In fact, we view God's blessing as from his hand. I mean, you, you hear that? I've heard that story and I was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, like, what's one week? But what I want to tell you this morning 
is that when it comes to following Jesus, it might just be one week that's the most important week. And it's not about checking boxes and going, well, I'm going to be here without fail and blah, 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 and all that sort of thing. But it's saying, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I'm going to train those, if I have other people in my house, I'm going to train them that we put Jesus first. That Jesus is the bread of life come down from heaven. Jesus himself is the manna every day. He is your daily bread, literally. Six out of seven days of the week. They went out every morning, and somehow there's this bread on the ground that they gathered up. And on the sixth day, they gathered up twice as much. You were not allowed to gather up any on the seventh day. And there was a reason, because on the seventh day, if you gathered any up, you were in big trouble. Actually, if you got... Anyway, put it this way. Manna ended up with maggots in it. So there's something about seeking God. And, and let me just say this, and, and then I'm going to extend this invitation to those of you who would like to just humble yourselves. And, you know, because the cross is the most beautiful picture. The cross and communion are the two most beautiful pictures of Jesus as the bread of life and us yielding to him as our provider. See, when we go to the cross and we kneel before the cross where Jesus once was nailed, and now he's risen. But when we go before the cross, we're saying, God, I'm recognizing that you have given the bread of life as the sacrifice for my sins. It should be me paying the price, but you paid it, and I received from you. And then Jesus says in communion, take this bread. It's my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My blood, drink it, because it's been given for you, for the forgiveness of sins. And when we come to the cross, we switch ownership. We say, here are the keys. I give you control of my life. I'm going to trust you. Forgive me for trusting in my own abilities. Forgive me for trusting in the stock market, for trusting in my retirement, or trusting in what I don't have in those areas and being freaked out about it. And saying, Jesus, I want to honor you first. Would to God that we would be a people that just bring such pleasure to his heart because we come right into his gates with thanksgiving and his course with praise because Jesus is the bread of life. <laughs> Let's all stand. Lord, today we just say we want to make much of you as our provider. And Lord, I pray that for those who today you're speaking to their hearts, maybe it's a time for repentance. Maybe it's a time for asking forgiveness, or maybe it's just a time to come and thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, their provider, to surrender their life to you. I pray you would give them courage now to respond in Jesus' name.